som vi kan lyfta och inbjuda till det här mötet så kommer det till den här tiden för att till våra gäster här och sen ges det tid för, för frågor. Men innan dess så skulle vi gärna vilja att vi, vi var och en kunde säga våra namn och hur länge vi har varit medlemmar i kyrkan. Och det kan vara från början på vårt möte här och vi kan göra det på svenska. Nu är som heter jag då, och jag har varit medlem nu i Häpplandsveckan snart 40 år. Okay. I'm Alex Kopitschka, I'm from Germany, I'm 54 years old of age, and I was born in a hospital that raised in the church all day. <laughs> Good evening, brothers. This is I'm Marlon Benson, I'm nearly 70. And uh, previously, between 2001 and 2004, I worked here in Europe. I worked in the area of presidency like President Kopitschka now. During that time, I had a chance to meet many of you and to be here in Sweden several times. I'm in Danish origin, and I have cousins, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very grateful to be here tonight. I look forward to knowing who each of you is. I'm Richard Turley. I'm the assistant church historian and recorder. I've worked at church headquarters now for about 25 years. Thank you for introducing yourselves, brothers and sisters, and thank you for being such good English speakers. Uh, Brother Hayden told me that when he visited your conference, President Max in Oberlin, with the boy, the last time he did that in 2005 or something, he decided to have no translation. And so when the conference was over, Elder Haven said to President Matson, what percent of your people do you think understood me? And you said, 97, 98 percent. And Elder Haven said, that's better than I do in America. <laughs> 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 so I appreciate that you have all uh, in your lives learned English. And I want to say how grateful uh, Brother Shirley and I are to be invited here to be sent here, actually. As you know, 70s don't hold keys, so we do what people who hold keys tell us to do. And you may remember that Elder Nelson was here on a recent visit, and with him was Elder Rathvan. And as a result of that visit, uh, and some other things, they asked Brother Truly and me if we had a trip that would take us close to Europe, if we would stop by and hold a meeting like this. And so we are on a trip. We're going to New Zealand. And, and somehow Stockholm is on the way. <laughs> <laughs> Just takes an extra 36 hours. So we left home on Saturday morning and we'll fly back actually to Los Angeles tomorrow and then go on down to the Pacific for a couple of weeks. But I'm glad to be here. I want to to thank President Kopischke for being here tonight as your area president. And I want to invite him to say anything he wants to say at any point during the meeting, but he's mentioned that he'll at least say something at the end, if not before. And I'm grateful to get to know Elder Olson tonight, who is the local area 70 here, who is such a fine man. I feel like we're among friends, brothers and sisters. I don't feel like this is a meeting of uh, adversaries, of us against you or you against us. We're all Latter-day Saints. We have so many things in common. We have all done certain things the same way in our lives, made certain decisions, made certain promises, and life is long, as we're finding out. And in the course of life, uh, Often it turns out different than we might have imagined. I think of this often as I marry a young couple in the temple and think back 45 years ago when my wife and I were married about our view of life and our vision of life and how different really it's turned out. 
Some of it's much better than we could have hoped. Some of it's not as good as we could have hoped. So I hope at least tonight you'll feel uh, comfortable, feel loved. I want you to understand that we're not here because your local leaders need our help, particularly. One thing I learned in coming to Europe, in fact, I learned it from President Kapitschka. I went on a long ride with him when I first got here. And I said, could you tell me something that would help me be a good leader, a good American leader in Europe? He said, yes, I can tell you something. Listen to the European leaders. <laughs> Remember that conversation? It was the most important thing he could have told me because uh, what tremendous leaders you have and had. And one of them that I grew to love during my time here was this handsome Viking, Hans Matson. So I, I just want to begin in a spirit of love and uh, common understanding with you and say that we're here because Brother Turley and I right now have charge of the church's history department. And it seems like many of the questions that have been raised here, and I want to say to you, they're being raised in other places. This situation in Sweden might be a little bit unique because it seems to involve a group of you who are loosely networked. But everywhere across the world, because of the internet and the explosion of information that's come, there are people who have questions they've never thought of before. And there's information that's never been available before. And in many ways, it's a, it's a tremendous opportunity. In most ways, actually, it's a tremendous opportunity. And one of our hopes that I think we're, we're bringing to pass is that everything the church has in the way of historical information will one day become available to the whole world. We're doing our very best to internationalize church history. And uh, one of the ways we'll do that is by putting on the internet our church history catalog that lists everything that we have. And then over time we'll make digital copies of all of our documents and make those available to people all across the world. So it is a day of information, but with that comes the challenge of deciding what information is reliable, what information is true, what information is worthy of basing our life on it. And hopefully tonight we can at least offer some information in a reliable and loving way that will be responsive to some of the questions that you have. So that we don't start as big as the universe, I'd like to just create a little framework for our discussion tonight. And then uh, when I'm finished with that, we're going to invite you to share with us your most pressing questions. Um, and we'll put those up on the board here, and then we'll try to prioritize them, and then we'll give our very best responses to your questions in hopefully a very productive discussion format. And we'll go till you get tired or till we get tired. moved into the country or who had a divorce or a death or 
are down on their luck in some way. That led President Hinckley once to say, I don't know how the missionaries find some of the people they find. He said, the FBI can't find them. <laughs> the police can't find them, but our missionaries find them. <laughs> well, why is that? <laughs> They're lucky. They're lucky. And it is the poor, often, that are lucky. What is there in our universe, brothers and sisters, that, that drives or impels or motivates people to come toward truth? Can you think of something doctrinally? Maybe I'll just say it. We won't take time to make this a discussion. But we know that there is a life or a spirit of Christ that is at work in our universe. It's spoken of in section 84. It's spoken of in Moroni 7. It is a spirit that is born into the heart of every person who ever comes to earth. And it says in Moroni that it invites and entices and persuades people to do good and to come unto Christ. Some would call this a universal conscience. It's something that brings the seeker toward truth. And I think we've all felt that in our lives. It's nothing unique to the church. It's just out there for everybody. And it does create in the world, I think, a, a sort of a universal morality. On the other hand, there is another spirit. It's the spirit of the devil. And uh, I would like to read a scripture on this one. It is spoken of as well in Moroni 7. If you've got your scriptures, you might want to turn to the seventh chapter of Moroni. It says in verse 16, For behold, the Spirit of Christ is given to every man that he may know good from evil. Wherefore I show unto you the way to judge everything which invites to do good and to persuade to believe in Christ is sent forth by the power and gift of Christ. Wherefore ye may know with the perfect knowledge it is of God. So that's the mind of Christ, the spirit of Christ, bringing us toward truth, bringing us toward God, bringing us toward Christ. Verse 17, however, says, but whatsoever thing persuadeth men to do evil, and believe not in Christ, and deny him, and serve not God, then ye may know with the perfect knowledge it is of the devil. For after this manner doth the devil work, for he persuadeth no man to do good, no, not one. Neither do his angels, neither do they who subject themselves unto him. So you have a counter spirit, the spirit of the devil and his angels. And these forces are working on every one of us, brothers and sisters, who comes into this life. This is really what creates agency. Look at this for a moment if you have your scriptures in 2 Nephi 2, where Lehi is explaining this. In 2 Nephi 2.16, he says, Wherefore the Lord God gave unto man that he should act for himself. So we have the capacity to act, which in the church we call agency. The ability to make choice. Sure. And it says, Wherefore man could not act for himself, save it be that he is implied that word in Christ. I don't know what, what is that word in Swedish? Lokka. Okay. So Le Lehi is teaching his son that man could not act for himself, save it should be that he was enticed by the one or by the other. Now this may 
may look very simple to you, and you may be wondering why I've begun with this. But I've begun with this, because this is the common circumstance of all mankind. I think parents have to understand this to be able to deal well with their children. I think church members have to understand this to know what's going on in the world and in their lives. That there will always be two forces working on them. The life or spirit of Christ and the spirit of the devil. And within that tension that's produced by those opposing forces, that enticement that occurs, we have a wonderful gift from God. We get to choose. We get to choose. Good or evil, right or wrong. I think I've said enough maybe about, about that. Back to this thought. When a seeker, motivated by the love of Christ, comes in contact with the truth, and that truth is often preached by two missionaries. There's another spirit that enters into this process. It's the Holy Ghost. Which is in addition to the life or spirit of Christ. And one of its chief functions as the true members of God is to testify of God and to testify of truth and to testify of Christ. So everyone here who at some point has encountered truth and been a seeker has felt a spiritual prompting that we would call a manifestation of the Holy Ghost. And that has been manifest in different ways in our lives. Some describe that manifestation as a feeling of peace. Some describe it as a feeling of warmth. Some describe it as a feeling of certainty. Some describe it as a burning in the bosom. There are lots of scriptural stories and lots of historical stories that deal with this. But really you won't know much about it unless you've experienced it yourself. And sometimes it can happen as it did for Paul or for Alma in, a, in an instant. But for most people this can be a gradual process of coming to know, coming to feel. We're taught in... Doctrine and Covenants, section 88, verse 118, that we are to, to uh, seek learning by study and by faith, which indicates that in this process of coming to be a convert, we don't rely necessarily just on our faith. There is an element of study of learning about them, thinking about them in our minds, talking about them. And Doctrine and Covenants, <coughs> section 8, verses, I think, 2 and 3, talk about the Holy Ghost speaking truth to our mind and to our heart. <coughs> Which again indicates that within each of us there are two centers, really, of knowing. There's the more thoughtful or rational part, our mind, and the, the more feeling part, which the Lord describes as our heart. So the process of becoming converted can involve both study and faith, and the Holy Ghost can speak both to our mind and to our heart. Gospel truth can be very logical, can be very compelling, but it can also induce great feeling. Usually it's some combination of this. And actually when these work together, they're a wonderful check on each other. So again, I'm saying that in most of our experiences, brothers and sisters, we've had some uh, experience like this where we encountered truth. I'll just take uh, the, the uh, circumstance of the day of Pentecost, which is a very good uh, example of people being preached to, hearing the truth, saying to the apostles, what shall we do? 
and they were told to repent to be baptized. At that point, they had felt the Holy Ghost, and they had what might be called a testimony, which is a conviction of a truth. But it's not a conversion at that point. It's just a testimony. Conversion is a longer process of coming across this continuum here and ending up being born again or having a change of heart. Or be healed, as the scripture sometimes describes. There is a difference between having a testimony and being completely converted. That's why the Lord can say to Peter, When thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. Peter had a testimony, but he hadn't yet experienced a complete change of heart. Now, this is important background in my view before we turn to your concerns tonight because all of us are somewhere on this continuum. We're hopefully seekers. We hopefully have some experience with the Holy Ghost. And in response to the question, what shall we do? The answer was repent and be baptized. And hopefully we're moving across this continuum working to be born again, working to have our hearts changed, working to be completely converted. But while that's going on, we still have these two powers to deal with. And every day, as we're in the midst of this, brothers and sisters, we have to make a decision. And the central decision we have to make is whether we're going to believe or whether we're going to doubt. And that's a decision. Now, everyone who's decided to believe, not everyone, but most of us who have decided to believe are, are as aware of the questions that you have as you are. And maybe even a lot more questions that you haven't thought about yet. So I just want you to understand that everyone is experiencing kind of a similar situation. Uh, when you say... Uh, that we, uh, sorry. When you say we are aware of the questions that you have, and, and it sounds like you, and then many more of you, I don't know, is it the apostles you're talking about? No, I'm just talking about Brother Terry and me who have received questions from okay. some of you in preparation for this meeting. And you're aware of a lot more things that we might not be aware of yet, but still you stand and you think, I can, I can stand for this. Right. Okay. Yeah. So you rather turn, not, not anybody else. Well, I'm hoping there'll be others. <laughs> <laughs> I know about me. And I don't have any doubts about Brother Turley. Okay, that's a very good question. Yeah, we have been given in advance some uh, indication of what your questions have been. So I'm just saying they're very good questions. There are questions being asked by others, and there are a lot more questions that could be asked. Well, you have very good answers. We'll see, you'll see in a moment. We'll have what answers we have. But, not stop on this point. We need to go to the Bible just for a moment. The second thing is to... How many of you have ever had a philosophy class? So you know what the word epistemology means. Well, epistemology is a branch of philosophy that has to do with how we come to know. It's the science of knowing. And obviously in science, there's a scientific method as a way of knowing. You postulate a theory and, and you try to produce proof. And that works out the way you hope it will, then you may have something that's truthful. This is what the Lord says about knowing in the spiritual realm, because our trip here can only be truthful if we keep our answers in this realm of spiritual knowledge. We're not dealing with a science. And so when Paul wrote to the Corinthians, who were the intellectuals of this day, he said in 2 Corinthians 2 and 9, So as it is written, 
eye hath not seen, nor ear heard, neither hath entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. So there are some tremendous things reserved for those who love God. And then he talks about how we come to know what those things are. And this is what he says about learning spiritual things. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. And then this very important verse, 11. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of man which is in him? Even so the things of God knoweth no man, but the spirit of God. Second Corinthians, excuse me, First Corinthians 2, starting at verse 9. First Corinthians 2, verse 9, 10 and 11, and now I'm in verse 12. Paul says, Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God, which things also we speak not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. And then this is important. But the natural man, the man without God's Spirit, receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned, or evaluate it. But he that is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. For who hath known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. So as we take your questions now, and do our best to respond to uh, issues that you see in our history or in our doctrine, I just want to have you bear in mind that uh, no matter how smart Brother Terry might be, and no matter how good his answers might be, the only way that these answers can help any of us is if they're spiritually discerned, if they're given by the Spirit and received by the Spirit, if they somehow get deep into our heart. There's nothing that I know about Mormonism that bothers me. Are there contradictions? Are there inconsistencies? Are there paradoxes? Yes. It's been a church full of people. Is there any of you that doesn't have an inconsistency, a paradox, or a contradiction in your life? Come see me after, please. <laughs> the NC first chapter says, it will be my mouth or my servant's mouth. It will be the same. Right. So we, none of us here, I think, are apostles or seer or revelators. But I think we have a first presidency, have that title, and the 12 apostles have it. So if they talk with the Spirit of the Lord, I think that we should trust them. We can trust them. Yeah, Absolutely. as far as they is true. But sometimes it changes. That's a little, don't you bother you a lot? Not at all. Not at all. They have a chance to say something in the name of the Lord that is done by you. Well, you need to give me some four instances, some examples, and then we can, we'll deal with those. Yeah. But let me just say this. I've worked at church headquarters for 22 years, and I've seen our leaders at very close range. Brother Curdy and I, twice or three times in the last two weeks, have been with the First Presidency on issues and yeah. decisions. And I, I know of no dishonesty. I know of no motive that isn't pure with the leadership of the church. Um, so, yes, it's okay to ask a question on Yes, but can I just finish this? Sure, of course. Hang on just a second. I, I, just, I need to stress this point that we have to have the spirit of the Lord because eventually, brothers and sisters, as a result of our meeting tonight, each of you is going to be left to make your own decision. And we're not going to have enough time, nor would we have the knowledge, if you're looking at it as a scale. Do you remember 
a parable about a donkey that stood between two equally attractive stacks of hay and couldn't decide which stack to eat from and starved to death eventually. It's called the ass of Buridan. You could be like that. We could all be like that in our lives. What we have to do is evaluate what is there that tips the scale in favor of the truth of Jesus Christ in Latter-day Saints? What is it that tips the scale away from the church? And tonight we're hoping to bring to your attention some things that we feel tip that scale toward belief. But nevertheless, you're going to have to decide. It's a choice. It's an act. It's your agency. And we're not here to force you in any way. I, I want you to know that I've made that choice. It's been a fantastic choice for me. I have great happiness, great peace, great uh, hopes and anticipation of the future because of this choice. I know that the church is true, and my prayer tonight is that those of you who may be in power may have some of your doubt removed, may be inclined more toward belief. Alvin thought that a man has to have a desire to believe. And I'm, I'm very prayerful tonight that all of us will leave here with a greater desire. And I say this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Mm -hmm. Now, let's take your questions. I'll ask Brother Turney to write them on the board. <coughs> let's just get a representative group of your questions up here to see what it is that concerns <coughs> Brother Hans, since you had a question, do you want to just give us one that we can work on? We'll, we'd like to have eight or ten questions, and then we can talk about it. I'll, I'll take, I'll give the word to, to the... Okay. Right. You're a wise man. Well, I'll start then. Um, can we göra så god att vi kan prata rätt högt för att det är svårt att höra annars? Okay, så so, förstår jag nu. Yeah. All right, one of my questions uh, is regarding the process of how the Book of Mormon came about. And uh, growing up in the church, I remember still that when I was taught about how the Book of Mormon came about, and especially the pictures shown to me in primary, which was me on where we have Joseph Smith sitting on one side of the curtain and his scribe on the other, and Joseph Smith had the, the plates in front of him. Uh, translating from them, uh, and also as a missionary and as a Sunday school teacher, we, we've been taught and I've taught, you know, the importance of the original plays, and then coming about, you know, how I had to make the choice of killing Nathan in order to, to get the plays, and how to then pass them forward from father to son for a thousand years, right. and Moroni almost died in, in just trying to pursue, preserve them and finding them buried in the Yukimura. And then finding out them by, by recognized historians, even members of the church, how, how the process isn't really corresponding with that picture, that in fact the, the translate or the how the Book of Mormon came about was actually by Joseph Smith looking into the hat in his seer stone. The stone that he found in a well and the stone that he used both before and after becoming a prophet in, in seeking for treasure. Uh, and this then the question to me that I don't expect you to answer, but you know, there's a lot of efforts being made in order to make this place come about. And they weren't even part of the process. They were hidden away most of the time, sometimes not even in the same room while the, the writing was being done. That's one question, obviously, that I don't really expect you to answer. But the second question is, okay, good. But the second question is, why? Why don't we present this Diva? Why, why do we still keep to this version that the place we use in an actual translation process, as I understand it's basically using a document and moving it over to another document, while it's in fact was some sort of revelation more or less that may have come forward. So that's my question, because I don't see that the, 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 the portrait of the church does today really correspond with that what we have. So that's a confusion, and I would like to get that. Thank you. Both very good questions. Thank you, Brother Hans. Yeah. Thank you, Brother Hans. Others? Please. Okay, I think it's a difficult question. <laughs> Okay, I have a question about, you know, we're always taught in the church that, you know, uh, when on a certain time, like from the time of Abraham, uh, you know, God revealed that we can, uh, that the, um, what is it difficult, in not my language, but, you know, it's, it's okay to have uh, more than one wife. So, and that is not my question, but my question is, 
how is, is it a teach? Did you do? Do the church believe that it was a teaching from God that you married women who had other men who were still alive, okay. and even his own apostles' wives, and um, when they were away on missions, and you know all the stories probably. And I have question, is that a teaching from the church, or is that a, you know something we do that he did wrong? Okay. Okay. Polyandry. Polyandry, yes. Yeah. So the question is polyandry. <laughs> Polygamy is when a man has multiple wives. Polyandry is when a man marries another man's wife. And Joseph did both. So your question is about polyandry. Yes. Okay. Especially I think in the fact where where they actually married women who were actually were married to, to righteous men. Like yeah, apostles. Yeah, apostles and missionaries and apostles. And another question is that I have, for example, one woman that said that the child that she bore, she didn't know if it were the child of Joseph or the child of, in this case, uh, Orson Hyde, I think, the apostle. So that, you know, indicates that it was definitely not a spiritual marriage or it was all the way married. So I have a question. What do you feel about that? Spiritual versus actual <laughs> marriage, conjugal marriage. I have six daughters. You won't even think of a question that they haven't already asked. <laughs> 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 Thank you. Just would like to add uh, a question to that, just actually. Um, according to information I have read a number of times, which has been published in books, etc. Uh, which I think seem to be very firm and correct, uh, how the wives were forced into marriage. It wasn't so that they fell in love with Joseph and said, oh, now I would like to be a wife. It was so that they were put under tremendous pressure to accept the marriage where they were told that the church will go under, your family will go under, and you have only until, let's say, tomorrow to decide whether to marry me, that it will have terrible consequences if you don't accept the marriage. And I think there are, are so many reports and... and uh, books, etc., where, where these women have written, so I think we don't have to doubt that it was actually a real marriage. I would like to say here, mistresses rather than wives, actually. Are so you speaking just of Joseph Smith bringing this pressure yes. to bear? Yes, yes. Okay. Uh, my, my, real, my other question was about um, the book of Abraham. If you please can tell us a little bit about your view of this. I mean, we, we all believed, or the church members believed, that this was uh, actually a translation of the... Um, uh, the information Joseph got before, as you know. Papyri. Yes, exactly. And we also know that through the Rosetta Stone, that actually it is possible today to translate hieroglyphs into English or any, any other language. And we, we know now that it has actually nothing to do with translation. This was something written 1,500 years after Abraham, about 500 before Christ. And, and there's no connection to Abraham whatsoever. And this is such a fundamental thing in church. I mean, this is what we're told in the temple. And this is what we have as a holy scripture. So, um, and I've, I've seen a number of explanations from the church how this could, could be, if I say so. I would like to hear what kind of version you have today. Why it sounds Version 2.1. Okay. Well, thank you. I have a question that's really related to polygamy. When I was on my mission in London in the 70s, we worked after a very important principle called lying for the Lord. I mean, we taught that. Um, it's supposed to have been coined this phrase by, uh, I think, John Taylor. And I wonder, uh, do you think that there are any circumstances when it's okay to withhold or manipulate truths just to uh, defend or uphold the reputation of the church. Is life for the Lord still alive? That's my question. I have a question for you. Who's talking to this? I can tell you afterwards. Let's do it. Thank you for your question. Because nobody has ever asked this before. Thank you. Perhaps someone can help me. On my mission serving in Scotland, I came across uh, something and that was the first time I really stopped and pondered. Uh, somebody smart enough to write documents that were false, but church buying them 
from this map. Well, not the not cost, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's just my my question surrounding why the church acted the way they did. Okay. And, and the other one is uh, uh, blood atonement. It's just a strange thing altogether in, in my in my view. Okay. What's up with that? <laughs> <laughs> you can just turn it around. The true side of the world. Could I just please add a thing to my first question? But my, my first question was about uh, the portrait of, of the, the translation. Not that I didn't feel that it corresponded to what we had. I also have the same feeling when reading about the first vision and Joseph Smith. I see, as I've understood by Bushman amongst others, that, that in fact, after the first vision, he claims that he was persecuted because of the first vision. And there was a lot of uh, happening to run. And he, he said, me, an obscure boy, why are they giving me so much attention? Well, as in history, I, I find it, and I, I don't think it's disputed, that nobody really, not many at least, found out about the first vision until later when it was written in 1838. There was one account in 1832. No, sorry, that was about, yeah, 132 also. But I mean, it came about even much later, and um, the question is why, why does it really, you know, many members of the church early in 1830, they didn't, most of them hadn't even heard it. So the why they joined the church was mainly because of the Book of Mormon and the vision about the New Israel and all that. So, so the, the first vision, as we teach today, is it's not the big faith foundation of the church originally, but it, it came later on. So that's the question, why? Why doesn't these two pictures correspond in the way we, we perceive things in the progress of the I have been a member of the church since 1962, and I've been a master of science in engineering physics since 1978. Uh, despite my critical and truth seeking nature and education, the church succeeded in making me a happy and truly believing member for 43 years. Five years ago, I discovered that the church, as an organization, had systematically deceived me by only telling a carefully selected, one-sided version of church history. The discovery was extremely painful to me and my wife. And we kept it, uh, uh, we didn't tell the children or grandchildren. Do the leaders of the church really believe that they are actually inspired by God to act in such a way? Just to tell a selected, nice version of the church, of the history of the church, in order to get more converts. Do they believe they are inspired to do this? Thank you. That's a broad sword. Well, yeah. Hmm? You're making the assumption that that's what they've done. So, the last few churches basically were sanitized churches. Yeah. Yeah. Can I just uh, fill in a little bit? Yeah. In this uh, uh, PBS television on the mornings for five years ago or something, mm -hmm. I actually was here in Florida, so I had, had a time to see it. And the packet says there, it's not good for the members to know all the truth. I have the DVD with me, so you'd like to see it. <laughs> but he, he used to say things like last conference as well, they changed it afterwards. But he says, <laughs> he says that it's not good for a member to know all the truth. And he said as a, as a watchman on the tower, he liked to stop things that could hurt, even the truth can hurt. Yeah, okay. just, just to fill in what you're saying. Well, yeah, the package is not the whole church, but he's very, he's very known about in the church and outside the church. <laughs> yeah, the question really is, is all truth, is all truth useful? So we will come deal with that. One, one more, please. I don't know, I've, I've already asked, or if anyone else would like to ask. Anybody else? Can, but otherwise, I have two more questions on truth. <laughs> Christina, do you want to ask another? Yeah. Uh, one thing that really bothers me is um, 
the lack of contemporary sources for the angelic visitation, as I understand from both Michael Quinn and Bushman. They say, as I understand, that there, there are, of course, sources from 1829, 1830, affidavits, letters, minutes, but none of them ever mentions any angelic visitations or a priesthood visitation that way. And the earliest that the mid-30s Queen says, and Bushman refers to 1838. Uh, as an historian, Brother Troy, you should be worried about the uh, credibility of the claims when the written sources are not contemporary. So I wonder why are there not any uh, contemporary testimonies for all that? I'm just going to try to recall, get this point to share with you an appearance we made before the first president. Okay. Last week on an issue just like this. Mm -hmm. Can I have a uh, question now? <laughs> Not just <laughs> add a question. Uh, it puzzles me a little when I read about the priesthood and the blacks. And uh, when I read about David O. McKay, and he was uh, an apostle and so on, and he really had it up on the on the board of physician of 12, and they had it fixed, and I'm sorry to me in this English, he had it uh, made okay that they should have the priesthood, but three of the apostles were not there, and when they come back, they said no, so they have to cancel it, and then they have to wait some years to listen Kimball come in, and then he talks a lot, uh, listen to his son, uh, and it's Kimba's youngest son, and he says, yeah, they take a lot of years. He talked to a lot of uh, the twelves, and he, they would even uh, discuss what would happen with the church if it launched this, and how many will we lose, or what, like a company, a business, you know, say so we do that and that. And is this true that there were some apostles that went against uh, the, 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 the question to give the priest to the flag. And then to see that uh, I was on a mission seminary, you know, and uh, we, we, we loved uh, uh, Mark Peter, no, Peterson, yeah, yeah he was here, but yeah, yeah he, he, he talks a lot about the blacks and the pre existence and they were damned and so on because they were blacks. And he, for me, he was an apostle. For me, he, he was the doctor in comment section one, <laughs> my mouth or my servant's mouth, and I thought he was a servant. But then he, he, he fell out that he was uh, teaching false doctrines. If we look at it now, at least if I start to preach it, I would think I would call false doctrines. Mm. Uh, but when he did it, it was okay. And many people felt a great spirit. Mm. They were converted, they had the spirit testifying it was true, and it was not. And, and then, and I have a, to this I have a personal experience. I love the way you put up the devil there and, and Christ there. I'm glad I'm not a Muslim because I have problem with Christ there. But, <laughs> but uh, anyway, uh, when I went to the temple the first time, I was uh, 1970 in Switzerland, in Solikofen. And after being in there the first day, I was terrified. I couldn't sleep at night. I thought, what is this? You know, I, there was a black hole in my whole uh, heart, and I had more my way to nightmares. Nightmares. And the whole week, and I thought, what is this? Have I been deceived? And I, but then I thought, okay, I see my father there. I see him my branch president, and I said, maybe it's wrong on me. So if I look at the Holy Ghost, he should be peaceful, he should testify, I will have a burning feeling, I will be happy. If I would follow that description, the devil talked to me and said, this is not right. But, you know, it, it's, it's hard to say it, but it really hurts me, and I feel sad about it. You know, and I, I know a lot of people have the same experience. Mm -hmm. I'm not alone. I even had it with my brother. I don't tell who it is, but he's here tonight. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it's something. Oh boy, I wonder what, what did I do wrong? But you got the question. You got a black and a priestly question. And I don't know if you want us to address your temple question. That's something we could want me to. 
you just wanted to see if this is another side of what you started to, to do. If you like to answer it, I don't know, but it disturbs me. We've got uh, 13 questions up, so I think we've got enough questions, unless you've got one that's very easy to hear about. I have one. All right. <laughs> um, we had some Vikings visited North America about 1,000 years ago, and today we know exactly where they lived, actually. There are archaeological uh, uh, evidence that they, they lived there, etc. Right. So what about all the millions of people who have been Lamanites and Nephites, you would say? Uh, what kind of evidence can you show that actually did exist? Every single small Indian tribe in the whole of America, as we know about today, because they all leave buildings, they leave tools, they leave anything which we can prove that they are there and been there. And, and as far as I know, there is absolutely nothing proved that there have been Nephites or Lamanites in, in America. If you have time, you can also maybe comment that the, Indi the American Indians and the DNA and the connection to, to Lamanites, Nephites, and then back to, to the Jewish people. It would be interesting to hear. Okay, we'll finish off around after the right? <laughs> <laughs> Could I just please ask a short question? Because I'm just very happy that you're here, so I'm just taking the chance now. I might be a bit egoistic, so I see this my way. But I, I would just like to ask another thing. And I've heard uh, it's about the Adam God theory. And my question is what was it about? Adam God. The Adam God theory. And, and my question is not so much about, um, I've heard answers to how, how Brigham might have thought about it. And my question is, how come it divided the church at the time? You know, there was a lot of apostles and leaders that didn't agree to what they heard Brigham say. So, if, uh, I, I don't know, what, what is the church opinion on Adam God as Brigham taught it, and why didn't they clear it out if, if it is the way you, I think we think that, that he actually thought that, that um, Adam is not Henry Potter, but he's him. But why couldn't he make the other apostles understand that? That's quite a simple thing to do. Why don't we say that? just be in These are questions I think that Rick has dealt with before. As you're going to see, he has a very concise way of speaking. To begin with, if you just gave an answer to each one and then pause, and we'll see if they have an additional question about it. Let's just move through them. I'll shift in where it might help. The big challenge here, of course, is time. Uh, if we want to get into these questions in detail, we would be here not just four hours, but one day, you know, maybe weeks. So I think that's going to give you a very concise answer, uh, but there's a lot behind those concise answers. So let's take the first one, how the Book of Mormon came about. Why is it that our... Uh, if you don't give it, can you give us a reference that you can, like, later go in and check? Yeah, exactly. Check this one. Uh, what you say? This we brought a handout for you. Okay. You know the answers. <laughs> you know the questions, right? Well, these are the five very best websites for authentic answers to the very same question. And let me say, if you'll spend as much time in these five websites as you've spent in other websites, because I have visited, as has Brother Jerry, some of these anti-Mormon websites, and uh, they're very dark to me. And Brother Turney and I know many of the people who maintain these websites. And I can say to you, they're not the people whose teachings I'm going to follow. But if I go to those websites, you'll get authentic, accurate information. Yes, by and large. And I'd like you to know that as a church history department, we have, at, at present, Packer's direction, put together a committee to create answers to difficult gospel questions. We are working on these answers now, and we're also giving thought to how we will disseminate these answers to the world. We don't want a website where people come to Mormon problems, obviously. But 
you'll find if you go to these websites answers that you can rely on to almost all of your questions, including Adam God. But we'll give you our best answers. We wanted you to know tonight there are answers. And do the church stand behind these websites? Well, they're all church institutions. Okay. They're either BYU or private institutions that are handled by very reliable and good letters. So they're not, they're not official church websites. Uh, we do have some official church things that are being developed, for example. Because look, I tried to find the church's own versions about these things. They don't exist. They're, they're, no, no, they don't, that's my problem. I won't, I won't tell what is the church, what, what did the church say about this? So we, Not we, what some smart listeners. Yeah. We hope you'll find, we hope you'll find more in the future to be helpful. One of the most helpful things I think we, you may find over time is that we're taking our church history library catalog and we're putting it on the internet next year. And then we're going to make digital images of many of the records and connect those to the catalog so that you can do so you don't have to just listen to somebody's summary, but you can actually look at the original documents yourself and make your own conclusions. Excellent. Yes. I, I have a question. We have sort of 15 issues that's on public yes. paper right now. And I just wanted to make sure, because I think it's important that we get it together here all together, that we really bring up the issues that are on the top of our minds, so that everybody here feels that if this needs an answer, it helps. Because there might be people that are talking speaking this evening that have other questions. I think it's important that we bring up the questions now so that we can now have a chance to get the answer. So is there a question you have that's more important than these 15? Anybody? <laughs> are these 15? Are they some just yes? Well, uh, it seems like um, these are not new issues. Uh, to my limited mind experience, the only new one is proposition A. That flows around the world, creating problems. Okay, so the, what you're saying is these are issues that have been around for a very long time. They're not. So recognizing the limitations of time, I'm just going to march through and give some very quick, concise answers to these. Um, recognizing that a thorough answer is going to take more time than we have. At some point, we may go a little bit deeper, just because it's hard to make a concise answer to some of them. So let's just start with the first one. As I understand this question, you were asking about why is there a difference between the way you first learned about the translation of the Book of Mormon, with church art showing you how it was done, Joseph Smith here, and then the plates, and the blanket, and another scribe, and so on. Basically, the a challenge that we have is that over the course of generations, people develop in their minds an idea about something happens. It's particularly true in the second generation, third generation, fourth generation, and so on. If you look at Christian art, for example, a lot of Christian art dresses people from the Holy Land in clothing and in environments that are not the Holy Land. They're Europe. And that's because you know, that's their conception. This must be how it was done. So what we have in church art very often is artists giving their idea of what it must have been like. But if you go back to the original documents and get, get back to original documents that were sometimes difficult for people to find originally, what you see is a different picture. So the bottom line is we're trying to make our art conform with the sources so that people, when they see images of the, the way things are done, They'll understand it based not just on an artist's conception, but on what the, the basic um, statements are. Let me, let me just give you an example. But it's not so much the picture, it's more than the teaching. I'm, I'm out there. The picture was just okay. an uh, uh, evidence of it, but it's yes. more the teaching. And even today, you know, the Urim and Thummim, for instance. Yes. So, sorry, but that's, that's, okay. we don't focus on the pictures, but that's fine. Okay. Yeah, more than so, the teaching. let me just restate what you're saying. You're basically saying that the, the, the way the story is told, the way you've heard it traditionally, differs from what you see in the historical sources. Is that, is that correct? Yeah, and that is, that is the kind of thing that does happen. And what we're trying to do as a department, the church history department, is to bring the curriculum in conformity with the sources. Let me just give you an example of one other Jensen mentioned. Last, was it last week or week before? Last week. Last week we went to the church leaders and we said to them, our historical research about the restoration of the priesthood and where it was restored is different from what our curriculum teaches. 
for chapel, the, the curriculum says that John the Baptist, if you look at uh, the head note to section 13 of the Doctrine of Notes, Section 13, that the head note at the beginning says, Ordination of Joseph Smith and Oliver Calvary to the Aaronic Priesthood along the bank of the Susquehanna River. Bank. Um, do you understand the, the meaning of the term bank? Yeah. yeah. Okay. We went back to the original sources, and Joseph Smith says that the restoration occurred in the woods, and Oliver Cowdery says it occurred in the bush, meaning, we think, a sugar maple grove. They used to call sugar maple groves the sugar bush. And if you look at the Susquehanna River here, and Joseph Smith's home here, the grove is probably up here, not here on the banks. So, our historical research shows that the restoration doesn't occur here, it occurs here. So we're going to change information to make it conform with the church history. So you've identified a genuine problem. Often, the way stories have been told over time don't conform with the history. And so our goal is to try to make them conform more closely. But how did it actually happen? How did it actually happen? Okay. Again, very concisely here, Joseph Smith translated the Book of Mormon, but the translation as a term is not the kind of translation you and I might think about. I worked as a professional translator in Japan. I translated electronics and engineering documents from Japanese characters into English. And I did that, you know, one character, a word, just like this, very, very slowly. Joseph Smith didn't translate that way. Joseph Smith didn't understand the language that he was reading. He needed the Lord's help in doing it. Now, some of you probably have computers or phones that have translator software on them. Right? No. Uh, so we understand the idea that there are other ways to translate besides going word for word in translation. Joseph Smith's translation was by revelation. And so that's how he translated. He translated by revelation. So why were the plates needed? That's your question, right? Why were the plates needed? So why are you in the thumb? And why the Yerman Thumma? The white hat. And why a hat, okay? Let me take those three in, in order. First of all, why, why were the plates needed? The plates were needed because the plates were real. And they were preserved, and they were passed down from generation to generation. Once Joseph Smith got them, then the method of translation was up to the Lord, and the Lord chose to use a method of translation that was far more efficient, far better, and far more accurate than anything Joseph Smith could have done letter by letter. Because it would have taken him... He didn't know the language, so how else was he going to translate it if God didn't help him? See, what were the other questions? Why the, why the Urban Thumb and why the hat? The Urban Thumb, maybe I should answer the hat question. The hat was apparently to block light out so Joseph Smith could see what he was doing with the, with the record. If, if you have a computer, sometimes the light, you know, affects your screen. We don't know exactly how it worked. Joseph Smith said he wasn't meant for the world to know how it worked. But he did say this. In the early days of his translation, he was relying on revelatory tools of some, some sort or another. Yerman thumb, seer stone, whatever the case may be. And that's been the case throughout religious history. If you think about the Old Testament, remember the brass serpent on the rod? People could look at the brass serpent to be healed, right? You had the Ark of the Covenant. You have consecrated oil. There are always these sort of tangible manifestations that are used to focus faith. After the translation of the Book of Mormon, Orson Pratt, a new convert, walked into a room where Joseph Smith was working on his translation of the Bible. And he thought in his mind, but didn't speak. He thought, Joseph's not using a seer stone. Why is that? And Joseph, as though he read Orson's mind, turned to him and said, Orson, when I was young and inexperienced in spiritual things, I needed that. I don't need it anymore. Okay. 
but can you can you see that we feel that it can be feeling to say that you translate, you know, you have the record and you translate on it. Like with the papyrus, you know, it had them all over his kitchen floor and he said he was translating them. But he wasn't it was much that was much better if he just said I was sitting and praying and got the revelation and not to be done. But it's kind of deceiving to say it in that way. Do you understand what I'm saying? I think, but I think that's the difference in perception rather than in reality. When Joseph used the term translate, he meant revelation. Okay? Uh, and the revelation, revelation comes in various forms. Uh, you, know, you yourselves, who believe you receive revelation, recognize that it comes to you in various ways. Sometimes it's a feeling, sometimes an impression, sometimes it may be a thought. In Joseph Smith's case, when he translated the Book of Mormon, it wasn't just a matter of kneeling and praying and getting words. There was, as section 9 of the Dr. Covenant points out, this effort associated with it. And we could go through that, but we're running out of time. Exactly. And I would really appreciate, not to be awkward in any way, I really want to know what you have to say about all these things. Okay. Because we, if we're going to continue asking questions about this, we will have maximum three questions, perhaps. Okay. Can, can we do that? That's why I wanted us ourselves then later to go and you know dig, dig deeper. All right. I'll open. Is, is that okay? Please. Yes. It's certainly okay, but we also need to get answers. Yeah. But, but the thing is, we won't get answers. They already said that. Then we need to choose okay. one question and get all had answers. Okay. I hope, hope we don't get answers. Still, let me give it up. Yeah. How much did the place weigh? There are different estimates. 40 pounds, 50 pounds, something like that. All right. Um, yeah, can I just get yeah, to use my personal yes. I love the fact that you're asking your questions. Thank you. Thanks for feeling that you can do this. I have a feel our desire to give you the best answers we have. But when all the answers are given and all the questions are asked, decision time. Well, that too. There is a book. There is a book. And when you read the book, when you read Mosiah's or Benjamin's discourses in, in the book of Mosiah, where you read young Alma in Alma 36 talking about his sins and coming to believe in Christ, when you read Moroni saying that he'll meet us at the bar of God, there's something there that I stake my life on based on a feeling. Sure, I know all of this. Yes, there are some things that we can't explain exactly. But there is the book, and there is the spirit of the Lord that we can anchor ourselves in. So I just, I want to add that. And I could do that probably at, at the end of every question Rick will answer, but I won't do it again. Let's see, it's the end of the Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I won't say anything about it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and there is something historically very remarkable about this book. I write books. Um, I've written several, and I'm in the process of writing several more. And I have a lot of help, and I have a lot of education. And it still takes me maybe a hundred drafts sometimes to write a book. Joseph Smith sat down, and in roughly 60 to 90 working days, he dictates this book. That is that all it sounds sounds amazing. It is amazing. But anyway, those are not the questions really. Okay. Thank you. Move on. I want to move on. Move on. Yes. I think I answered one or two here. Precisely. Joseph Smith's wife, Polly. Sorry. You didn't say why you present this view. Why does the church present the view? Why doesn't the church say about the seer stone more officially? In the early days of the church, they talked about it often. Mm -hmm. When you get to a second generation, they present it the way they tell the story, and over subsequent generations, each generation retells the story according to their own circumstances. But we are led by revelations, the church, so I mean, shouldn't then the leaders correct, so that not people every generation change the story? Or could we say this for every subject in the church? It's much of what you get about the history comes from the historians, and you come from people like me. To do the best they can under the circumstances of their time. Yes, you know, and then somebody else comes along later with new discoveries, new documents, and they rewrite. Okay? So it's, you know, don't put, the, don't put the responsibility on 
the process. But there's not people like ordinary people like me who are doing the best you know, we know how to do it. But somebody will come along later and do it better. Those of you who do anything, science, you know, you do the very best you can, and the next generation will do it better. Isn't that true? It's true here also. Uh, I know there are a lot of questions, but let's continue forward with the discipline of you know, getting through these. Joseph Miss Wise, polyandry. This is a very complex subject. This is one we could spend a lot of time on. Okay? Do that. Just, just basics. How many wives did the Basics. How many more did I do? So let me just answer some basic questions. Did Joseph Smith practice plural marriage? Yes. Many church members don't know that. The answer is yes. Did Joseph Smith practice polyamory? The answer is yes. Joseph Smith did practice polyamory. How many wives did Joseph Smith have? We're in the process, as you know, of preparing the papers of Joseph Smith for publication. We hope to include in the papers of Joseph Smith a list of Joseph Smith's wives based on the best available evidence. Okay, so we'll answer that question in, in the future. Why did Joseph Smith marry specific people? Which gets to your question about, you know, why did he marry the wives of people who were already married? Um, that actually boils down to a marriage by marriage statement. And it's fairly complex, uh, but it's an excellent question. We just don't have the time tonight to answer it, but there are answers. But to summarize then, is there a principle we believe in that it, should be, it could be practiced that way? Because we believe in poly polygamy. It's the principle we believe in still. So is this the principle we believe in in the church? I, yeah, I'm not, again, I'm not a prophet, okay? I can't tell you about the future. I, I've said to people who have asked me this question, do you think this is going to come back? I say, I think I have a better chance of being hit by a meteorite from space than having this come back. Okay. Um, but this not coming back. The, uh, they are still there now, isn't it? The church says there is no polygamy, but it is. Yes. So why, why do we talk different languages in the church? I mean, you go, to, I have a friend who his wife died, and I met another wife, and we can tell him, and he said, he said, we at least have two wives in this life. So we believe in uh, polygamy. We, yes, we, believe, we believe in the stealing of people for the afterlife. And of course, the question that arises in the world generally is, what do you do if you live during life with more than one person? What do you do if your spouse dies and you remarry? What happens in heaven? And the answer that section 132 gives is that you'll be together. Do we know a lot about how that works? We really don't. Or well, do we believe in it? Do we believe in the 132nd section? Yeah, I hope so. Yes, we do. Oh, so we believe in polygamy. Uh, we Thank don't, you. We don't practice polygamy on earth. No, no, no. Yes, we do. We go to the temples and see them. But you know what I mean. No. One, one, one man, one wife at a time. On earth. Yeah, but if it was legal today, would we have two wives? We, yeah. Yeah. Really? Could I take another one? It would, not, it would not change from the current position until the prophet said so. And as I said, I can't, I can't predict the future. But you must answer, so you, I think you can answer this. Do we believe in polygamy? We don't practice it on earth, but we believe in it because we are sealing more wives to, to we, a wife. We believe in the sealing of people as, as we talk. What do you call that? Well, I, what the, reason I, the reason I hesitate to say we believe in polygamy is if I say that, people will say, well, then you, you have more than one wife, right? Huh? I don't. You don't, right. So nobody else here does either, I believe. I've got to show you a lot of them. But that's, that's why I say it the way I say it, okay? But is that the technical way why you say that? Or is it really someone uh, telling you you can't say a polygamy? No, nobody's telling me anything. Okay. Just, do, just, do we believe in polygamy? We, we do believe in polygamy, and we don't, we don't practice polygamy. That's, that's what I'm trying to say. Good. We don't practice You said that. Okay. He just wanted it in concession. Yeah. Okay. Can, can you please try to convince us how this can be Christ-like, now if you look at Joseph Smith, to, to take the wives or, or have sex with wives who are already married to other men, or to force a 14-year-old girl to marry her? Can you explain that to us? I, I really would like, like to understand that. I mean, if you read the stories of these lives, and I have a whole book there, a lot of books published about this, mm -hmm. if you read the stories about this book, 
Do we believe these women were happy? I would like to say they were extremely unhappy because they were forced into a situation which they hated. And they were put, they were put in this situation by a peer pressure, by, by not a peer pressure, but pressure, pure pressure. And it did, they didn't do it like because of love, they didn't do it because of any such reason, just because they were forced into a situation. If, if we would have this situation in, let's say, a Swedish king in the 1400s, I would understand it. But if we have this situation with a person who called himself, you know, the, the, the second next to Christ, you know, and the, the, the founder of this church, I, I just can't get into mindset. I, I actually can accept polygamy. Uh, I, can, I can accept that. I mean, I, there's a lot of societies around the world today where it works fairly well. I mean, a lot of people in Sweden go to Thailand on, on, on vacation. Thailand is such a country, for instance. But, but to, to, to take other women's rights in, secret, in a secret way, force them into some kind of marriage, I would like to call it mistresses, or force the 14-year-old girl to marry him. Now, against her obvious will. I, I just don't understand it. Say behind the wife. Behind, yeah, yeah, behind, behind, behind his own wife. Even, even the, even the counselors in the relief society, led by Emma Smith, were his secret wives. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, you, you can't, it's the deeper you go on this, the worse it becomes. But this is true. Let me just understand. If we have more time, we could dissect this wife by wife. Let's pretty much what we have to do to get to the answers on this kind of We don't have that kind of time. Um, is it true in general? Or is it not true at all? It is, it is true that Joseph Smith practiced plural marriage and that he had wives who were not married to anybody else. And it's true that he practiced polyandry and that he did have wives who were married to someone else. 14 years old, 16 years old. Um, he had a wife who was 14 years old. But remember, okay, on the frontier in America, women married young often as young as 12 years of age, because the, the, the lifespan of people in those days was well, what it is huh? today. So on the frontier, not in, not in much of the rest of America, but on the frontier, if you look at population studies, if you look at censuses of peoples across the American frontier at the time, they often married quite young. So marrying a 14-year-old in those days was not the same. It was like marrying a 21-year-old today, basically. Uh, so well, well, the marriage was a sexual abuse as well, so you can't compare it. When you're married, that's your sex abuse. But I think that you can't compare that today. Right. I think, I think you cannot, a 14 year old, that's like a 10 year old, then. Well, well my, point is, my point is, there was a different societal norm on age marriage in those days. So, let, let, let's move on. This, this is a complicated one. Do like, you think that's the the most important question is, does the church recognize this practice as being okay? Polyandry. Does the church officially endorse this? Polyandry. Polyandry. Or, is they, or do they recognize that in my action, you know, did things in error? Do we have an opinion on that from the church? I've never seen a formal statement. Okay. But I have one from the But anyhow, I mean, the, the, the basic question here is, of course, that was this a mistake done by Joseph Smith? And if it was, how could it continue to be a prophet? And if it was not a mistake, it must be endorsed by the church, I guess. Okay, what, what the church does say on this, on this question about Joseph Smith in general is this. Either Joseph was a prophet of God, or he wasn't. Correct? And the, dis the way in which you decide that not just intellectually, but spiritually, is the way that Elder Jensen talked about at the beginning. That's the official church statement on the I've never seen an official church statement that goes into, into detail. But, but well, why does my spirit talk to me and screams wrong, 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 even if it's a prophet of God? Make a decision. Is it, is, do I have the devil in me who's talking to me and says I should understand this 14, 16 year old girls marrying and I, I can't, my spirit doesn't, I can't get it to, to my mind. Is it the devil speaks to me that I'm, I should accept that because Joseph Smith is a prophet? So he did that right. It was God told him to do that. Go behind Emma and take these wives. The wife, they were working for them in the house. Yeah, no, I know, I know. My reason for being here tonight is because of my sister. 
that are important to you. That's the church's position. Exactly how Joseph Smith did it, there are lots of scholarly debates going on about that. But there's some excellent work going on at BYU that should be out of the next year. But do they believe that the trends that the papyrus now are there are death rolls, or do I believe still is Abraham writing this? That person is writing as it says in the first person. The, the papyrus that we have, we know what books those are from Egyptian. Yeah, 1500 like, years. Okay. And, but you still believe that there are some fragments that we don't have that are 1500 years younger well, or older. We don't, we don't, we don't there's, a diff- there's a difference between the date of the copy and the date of the text. So the text, yes, we believe is older. The actual copy could be later. Yes. But there are even, I mean, there are even records of how you should be translated from each certain myth. So, yes. so it's very difficult to say that you know, he was in people, he saw these documents so he was inspired. Well, if, you, if you look into this, this uh, in detail, I mean, if with any kind of scientific brain, it's very, very hard to say that this was even close to the truth. Well, well, this, 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 uh, Human documents were written 1,500 years after Abraham. It, it's very difficult to come up with any theory to connect with that and Abraham in any way. And Joseph Smith wasn't just inspired, as I can see, because he actually wrote down, you know, this character meant this, this character meant this, etc. And when an expert looks at this, it's kind of a joke. Okay, well, the documents you're talking about have been misunderstood by many people, okay? It's the alphabet and grammar that I was talking about. It's actually, people have concluded early that that was the document Joseph had used to prepare the book of Abraham. It's not true. That document was prepared after the book of Abraham. And that's what I said. You need to look at this, at this new research coming out next year. On this. Because there's a, there's, a, there's a radical shift in the scholarly thinking on that. But isn't it the same thing that Kindrop's plates that Joseph said, yes, this is a good thing. But it's a problem. Joseph Smith did not say that. Well, a historian said that he said that, that those no, around him. If you, if you walk through all of the evidence, okay, from, from the time the Kinderhook plates were discovered, yeah. down to the time they were taken to Nauvoo, uh-huh. the time that you had an editorial published in the Times and Seasons, the time you had a broadside published in the Nauvoo Neighbor newspaper, to the time when Wilbur Fugate, one of the proponents of that fraud, made this statement, there's clear evidence that Joseph wanted to translate them and never did. Why didn't he? I think because they were a fraud. Wilbur Fugate, the man who, who helped to perpetrate this fraud, said explicitly that they wanted Joe Smith to translate it. Joe Smith said he would not translate it until they had sent it to the Antiquarian Society of Philadelphia, France, and England. So he never did translate it. So he never did to say anything about them, really. Someone else said that he said it. There are two people who said, they said something, but their statements are so contradictory. Yeah. Um, okay, let's just continue to do very quickly. <laughs> that's, 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 I guess, the church view on that issue that they came that, that, that he didn't translate. Yes. That's, that's the church view. Church well, again, there isn't an official church view. These are scholarly debates. Okay. 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 There's no official church, church view on that. All right. Um, just, just for all of this, you go through all these questions, and I see that Daniel is making some notes, and you refer to text that will be uh, posted later, and you will give website information. I think it's fair that we run through the questions, and then there are some stuff that you all want to follow up because we don't get all the answers tonight. Yes, yeah. so I'm, I'm just going to rest through here. Let's stop interrupting. I'll just keep going through here very, very quickly. Um, are, are there circumstances where lying is justified? Okay, the church teaches the Ten Commandments. Ten Commandments say, don't, don't bear false witness, right? The Book of Mormon says, we'll be into the liar. Was it practiced? Was it practiced? In all societies, there are clashes of moral imperatives, okay? But the Ten Commandments say, thou shalt not kill. But countries go to war, and people kill. If somebody attacks you in your home, you can defend yourself. Okay, there are these clashes where sometimes one moral imperative or ethical imperative becomes superior to another. If, if you're protecting your children and I'm a killer and I come to you and say, where are your children? Are you going to tell me? Probably not, okay? It's not comparable. But it's, it's a weird view. When people bring up this topic, what they're usually talking about is 
during plural marriage time periods when people were asked about plural marriage, okay? And again, it's a complicated subject, but basically people were trying to decide, do I say something or do I not? Do I tell the truth or do I not? Do we teach as a church that you should lie? No, we don't. I was brought up on a principle of strict honesty, and that's what I try to follow through. Uh, next, Mark Hoffman. I'll just recommend a book, and not because I wrote it, but I did write a book on this called The Victims. It was published by the University of Illinois Press in 1992. Let's go to that book for answers on that one. Uh, Blood Atonement. Very simply, this is my personal belief, and then I'll tell you what the first official church name and after I tell you my personal belief. My personal belief is that during Joseph Smith's time period, based on statements in the Bible, Joseph Smith said that when men shed blood, their blood should be shed. He's talking about scripture. And I think that when you got into the Brigham Young time period, that scripture was taken literally for a time that leaders taught that if people killed, then they deserve capital punishment. The yeah, Old Testament style event. And that, that sort of bounces around in the 1850s in particular, when people are talking about, well, how do you do this? You know, is it literal? How do you, how do you shed a person's blood in the process of capital punishment? And it gets to the late 1870s when they're basically saying to people, hey, look, our belief on this is the same belief that other people have who believe in capital punishment. Now that's, that's my very rapid historical summary of it. From a church standpoint, blood atonement, meaning that it's required for people to have their blood shed when they commit capital crimes, the church has gone on record saying that's not necessary. So that's the church position. Uh, let's turn those over real quick. There's, there's debate among historians about whether it was ever practiced. There are statements about it from Brigham Young and others speaking in the tabernacle, but whether it was ever practiced is a matter, is a question of debate among, the, among the people. Some say yes, it was. Some According, say no. to According to journals, we're not, we're not sure. The journal records are clear. Was it one to five, five to ten? No, that was more understanding. Pardon? That's according to Jones. said, did anybody die with blood atonement? We don't know. Okay. okay. I think it's possible. Absolutely. I think it's possible. But I don't, I don't have clear evidence where I can prove that it happened. Uh, persecution and persecution. Why did Joseph Smith say he was persecuted for talking about the first persecution? I believe he was. He immediately went and told his story to a religious leader in his community. That religious leader scoffed at what he had to say. And the result of that was what, from his vantage point, felt like persecution. From the vantage point of others, it may not seem like a big deal. But to a young boy, it seemed like a big deal. So just to just understand, so the persecution was, in fact, the, the response he got from that, that Methodist preacher. That and the way his family was treated subsequently. From the Methodist church then, or from? No, from, from other people in the community who heard about it. Okay. Okay. Selected church history and watchmen, there being a watchman on the tower. Let me take up both of those. In terms of church history, when people tell any kind of an account of history, it's always selected. If I ask you a question, tell me about your years in high school. The story you tell me may be different from the story that I get from your high school boyfriend or uh, another student in your class. They'll each tell a different story. And so church history, as I said before, is written and rewritten by each subsequent generation according to the things they think are most important at the time. Watch around tower. This is something that, as you mentioned, President Packer talked about a lot. I think his concern is that Providing information to people in a way that's going to destroy their faith carries with it a responsibility. I think Paul can say about that. Yeah. 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 Rick and 
nine hour in charge of this for the church, essentially, since we're over the church history department. And this, uh, this has changed a little bit in, in the course of the church's history. For a long time, we were a persecuted minority in America, and our hope was to present uh, our best face for the world. And our history was often written in what is called apologetic style. We were defending the faith. And in doing that, we, we, were, we were being selective. We were saying the best things about the church. It was a very natural thing, I think, for us to do in those years. But in many ways, we've come of age as a church. In America today, there are Mormon studies programs being founded at some of our finest universities. And the study of Mormon history and the Mormon way of life is something that actually thousands of people now are very interested in. The first volume of the Joseph Smith Papers has sold 65,000 copies. That's when the first volume of the papers of Thomas Jefferson may have sold 2,500 copies. So there's great interest in the church. And we are at a time, I think, when our history could be told as completely and fully as, as technology can allow us to tell. <coughs> but what I want you to know, because I think there is some hint of this, there's some feeling that somehow the leaders of the church have manipulated the church's history for some benefit. And I want you to know that is not true, nor is it true today. There, there's never been a, an attempt to suppress the history of the church or to tell the church's history in some untrue way, to put it into an untrue light, to gain some advantage, to gain progress to gain popularity or acceptance. I think every generation has done its best within the circumstances of its own time. And that's what we're trying to do now. We have apostolic advisors, Elder Nelson and Elder Holland, that we meet with every month. And we go directly to the presidency for approvals. And there's no feeling at that level of the church that we have anything to hide, brothers and sisters. I know that some of you have some sense of being betrayed some way. Hans, I said that about you. We haven't betrayed you. These things that you have learned about through the internet, mainly, have always been known, have always been out there in the books. The 19th wife wrote her story years ago. It's just been republished now. Everybody reading it. I think they found something new about the polygamy of President Young, but it's, it's been there forever. So I, I, I want you to know that there is honesty and good faith and an attempt to let the world see us as we really are. I wouldn't want to be a part of it if it wasn't that way. President. Last year, we, I don't know whether you remember, we visited you with my family, with some of my family in the family history department. We had two of our sons and my wife and we were seeing some of the original copies on the treasures of the church, all Joseph Smith original handwriting. And one thing that against me that you taught us that really caught my attention is that you said church history is really people's history. It is really the history of individual people. Now, most of what we have in church history and other things that comes out of individual journals of different people with different backgrounds, with different, different perceptions. Just two days ago, I was in a meeting with physical facility people. And there was a man that worked for the church for 40 years, bearing his last testimony as a Lord in Kimpo, Portugal, telling us a fantastic story that built his testimony about one day when he was in Cape Verde and all exhausted, that there were two angels laying his hand, their hands on his head and, uh, and blessing him so that he could carry on his work. And I was sitting there in that meeting that just was all in awe. The presiding officer said, well, I will find that in some journal, and uh, and I and I thought for a moment, you know, should I in this very meeting of something that was very sacred to him, obviously very sacred to him, the way he explained it. Now, if I would not have to make a record of what he has said there, I'm not sure if my record is really what he said or what he meant or whether he got it or not. And so the thing is that many of these things that we have, but I will, I will decide 
So in that way, I will be selective. I will not decide to use this story as any evidence or of anything. I'm using it here tonight to tell you how quickly church history, this is a history. The history of the church can take care if you want. What is the difference of the history of the church? It's no difference, it's just another place. So we have to deal with these journal entries, with these personal perceptions, um, and, and they are there, and they are real for these people. And we have to either say, okay, or not. But what, what did Brigham Young and these uh, people hide, like, like Mountain Meadows? They did everything they could to hide evidence and things about the massacre that happened. If they now wanted to talk about all the truth, I mean, like, and why did the church excu okay, excommunicate uh, lots of people, professors at BYU and writing books? Why, like, uh, whom Brody, she writes the same Bushman writes. And she did get kicked out of heaven. She can't come there because she, she wrote the book about his, uh, the history. Okay. And Bushman writes about basically the same thing. I mean, if the church is just all people should know, why, why do they even act in a way like that? On the, on the Mount Meadows Massacre, I'm writing a book now that will be published by Oxford University. Yeah, I know, I know, I know. On the period after the massacre to answer that question. On the question of people excommunicated... So they didn't hide it. Pardon? They didn't hide it. Did the church hide it? Did the church hide it? At the time, short answer, okay? You need to read the book for the long answer. Yeah, but they did hide it. They did. The short answer is that at the time of the Mount Meadows Massacre, when Brigham Young got out about it, the U.S. Army was on the door of Salt Lake City, getting ready to come in. Yeah, I know the war. Actually, massacre hit people. That was Brigham Young's feeling, okay? So that mountain of the is the last thing I want to talk about for those circumstances. Okay, let's, let's move on. Uh, lack of contemporary sources for angelic visitors. There are there are two basic things I want to say about this. Number one, the church in its earliest days was essentially a church of oral tradition. Okay? People did not write things. It's probably like you in your childhood. Maybe not. Maybe you wrote when you were a child because you were educated. But for people who grew up in a society where they didn't get a lot of education, they generally didn't write. Joseph Smith really starts writing around, well, our first revelation for which we have documentary evidence is in the late 1820s. So the first thing he starts writing is scripture. And then early revelations do have references to angelic visitation. Section 20 of the Doctrine of Covenants, the Article of the Covenants of the Church, is an example of that. DNC section 20 has references to an angelic visitation. And there are other, in 1832 history, has references to it as well. Okay, they don't pay blacks in the priesthood. The June 1978 revelation has a history to it, like all revelation. You have this period of time in which things are steadied out in the mind, and they eventually flower as revelation. That's, that's but my question was, was it three uh, of the apostles that didn't agree with David or Mackay? I don't know. That's one thing, I'm, I'm always... If you read Quinn's book about it, you, you would see it. Right, I don't know. But I, I haven't looked at the sources myself. Okay. I don't know. But it could be. But I think it's possible. Yeah. I think it would be entirely consistent with the way... Um, oh, that's okay. Thanks for that. Does that make sense? Yeah. Temple. Uh, what was the question on that one? Now, why do we have such a bad feeling bad when it comes to the temple? If the Holy Ghost was there, they should give a testimony that you feel good about it, that you like to go there again and you feel uplifted. But this is just all the source that you feel sad, you wonder what I've been deceived or what. You really have a nightmare, as well. Okay. At least for a week. Again, a short, short answer. The way people react to temple experience depends on their culture. There are some people in some cultures who go to the temple and they react to it very positively. There are others who do not. Yeah, but if it is a spirit, it should testify to if you are African or Indian, whatever. We, hope, we yeah. hope the Holy Ghost could ch uh, change his mind for an American or Swedish. 
He said, why? I gave an American answer to the Swedish so he couldn't understand it. You know? I mean, that's not the, the way I feel. <laughs> it works. <laughs> I remember sitting with one of our first daughter, actually, who went on a mission to, to Germany after her first temple endowment, which I attended with her. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I was her state president, so I did my best to prepare her. Since then, the church, as you know, has produced endowed from on high, which is a seven-lesson course for temple preparation, which I'm sure you must have in Sweden. But the temple, uh, because we, we have a very practical and utilitarian religion, we don't have the rich liturgy that the Catholics have or the Protestants. So the temple, for most people, initially, is a very different experience, Hans, as it was for you. But the Holy Ghost, I mean, this Lord Well, I know. I think my little daughter was quite worthy, but she was so uh, disturbed, I'll, I'll say, mm -hmm. so surprised by the nature of what happened there, that I not, I'm not sure that Holy Ghost had a chance to really help her that day. I remember sitting with her in the celestial room while she cried and said, Dad, what is this all about? And I wish I had done a better job. But she has persisted, and I said to her, if you'll keep coming and keep learning and keep praying on My first, and, uh, yeah, my first kill, I said, Deer Hunter, was terrible, but I learned to love it. You know, I mean, I know it's an extreme, uh, but, but in some way, I mean, the, the spirit should testify, I think, about the truth, whenever it is the truth. Do you know what I mean? I mean, I shouldn't need to go that 20 times to feel good. And uh, you know what I mean? Same as fair and farms? Um, it may be. Okay. okay, but let me just. If you have a family tree and it goes back like this and so on, I mean, Joseph Smith, no way exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Way out here. DNA cannot tell us about all of our ancestors. I was the president of the Genealogical Society of Utah, which oversees the world's largest collection of family history records, the Church's family history records. And we were very interested in DNA for genealogical purposes, to find out what it could tell us. And what we learned is that DNA can tell you about this line here. 
Okay, so, so why did it come from? And the DNA is say about this line here, which is mitochondrial DNA. So through DNA, you can learn about <coughs> the line that is all males down through here. If there's a female in this line, it's stuck in it can't go any further. Down here, you can tell about the line that's female all the way down. Okay? But what's in the middle here, you can't discover through DNA with today's technology. Okay? Now, if you take this out further, like this, what basically happens is, let's say you've got the one person here down to maybe, you know, 10 million or whatever. How many of those 10 million people have DNA that we can discover this way? Okay. If the, if the lines don't intertwine, the answer is just these two. This one and this one. What actually happens is that as people intermarry and you shift from male to female here or from female to male there, you lose the opportunity to trace their strands. So what happens over time is that you lose you lose DNA identity as you work your way down through time. So it's not always possible to be able to identify people who were there. But there's a bigger problem. The bigger problem is this. In order to capture DNA, in order to make a comparison, you need two things. One, you need to know what was the DNA of Lehi's family. And then two, what is the DNA of ancient American peoples? We know some, but not all the answers here. We're continuing to learn over time. The body of types of DNA for these people is growing. So this one, we have no way of knowing the answer. We do not know what Lehi's DNA was. The place where they were living at the time was a place that had immigration in and out. The kind of DNA they had is impossible to determine. So that's the, you know, that's the, the basic answer. You can't tell because you don't know what the DNA of Lehi's family was. So the people in the Americas now might have DNA from the eye, since we don't know the origin. They, they might be, they, they might, they could easily be descendants of Lehi for the reason I explained first with that chart. They might have DNA of Lehi, we just don't know what DNA is, what DNA Lehi's family has. So it's just possible. You don't think that he was from the house of Israel? Yes. Yes. Yes, but so is most of the world today. Well, but on that note, you know, you had the Jewish uh, rivers and everything, he was definitely believing in, you know, what he was believing in. They, they are very close. <laughs> Family to the Jewish people. So, you know, he was not Chinese and converted to Jewish. No, but if, but if his area is a crossroad, we have immigration coming in. It doesn't take very many generations before that, before that DNA is, as I showed you here earlier, it only takes one marriage for that to stop. If you are right with this description, it means that DNA can't be used to say anything about our ancestors. And I actually don't think that's, that's uh, correct according to scientific evidence today. I think you actually can't trace back with the DNA and tell, for instance, where the Swedish people are coming from or where the, where the uh, Asian people are coming from, etc. I think they can do that quite well according to reports I have said, I've seen. And it's, it's, I'm, I'm very, very surprised that you claim that this has no evidence at all. You can so you can follow this. Yeah, but if you say that's one person out of ten million, that that's not very good. Uh, well, if, if if these people don't intermarry, it's one. But if they intermarry, what happens is this line, let, let's suppose that this person has a child, and that child marries here. Okay? Then this DNA gets connected here and goes in along the male line all the way through. They have a daughter, 
and that daughter marries, and you have a line of daughters, and they come in like this. But the original DNA packs from here, they don't replicate now. I'm not an expert, but just your opinion, that since you know much more than this than I apparently do. But if you look at the, the tests they've done now with the DNA, they found with your mind, is you know, statistically, do you feel that it's it, it's very probable the outcome compared to what you know it would have been a bit easier if they would have found maybe some indication that would be stronger than would be some things. What what's your what's your opinion on it? Do you know, do you feel it's we are likely or it's statistically possible the way we see it? I, I grew up with a PhD father who was a scientist. Okay, he was a nuclear engineer, and I was taught scientific me methods and statistics and the importance of recognizing the limitations of the science. What I'm saying about DNA is it's an extremely important tool for finding out where people come from. This limitation is they can't tell us about all the people who used to exist. They can only tell us about some. Now maybe someday the technology will improve. Um, but today it can't. So because of these limitations, for anybody to claim one position or another on Lehi's families is inconsistent with the science. That's all I'm saying. Okay. You can't do it. Okay, that's, that's uh, those are the questions. I just want to conclude. There was one that asked with that Adam Gard. Adam Gard. Oh, Adam Gard. Adam Gard. Again, complicated question. People are going to put out of the subject. Bottom line, the church's position today is that while Michael was Adam, and as Adam, like, was the father of the human race, and through the process of exaltation can become celestialized, Adam is not God our Father. So in that way, we, the church opinion is that what Brigham Young taught is in accordance with what we believe today. It is. I mean, if you interpret it this way, I guess. If you interpret the way you interpret it, yes. Yeah, and I guess that's the church opinion, that he actually did teach it this way. Well, it's complicated, again, because we've got a lot of sources. Okay. Now, there, I haven't seen an official church position that goes back and deconstructs all those sources. So as a historian, I would say, I look at the, at the evidence, sometimes it's a little squishy. But is it true that we taught it in the temple, in Brigham Young's? Well, well, quite, quite, quite a long time. Conferences and speeches from Brigham Young? Well, well, they didn't catch spoken about the, uh, the gender conferences by Brigham Young? That's why I say the evidence is squishy, okay? If you go back into the early time period, you can find evidence that goes both directions. That's what I mean when I say it's okay. All right, I just want to conclude with uh, two statements. The first statement is about the questions that you asked. Um, Elder Jensen said, you've asked questions that lots of other people have asked. And there are other questions you haven't asked that other people have asked. The process of asking questions is part of this concept of by study and by faith. If you approach the church from purely the standpoint of study, or what we would call secular knowledge, you'll come out with a purely secular answer. What we're asking you to do is combine study with faith, which is a choice. Okay, it's a choice that you have to make. Now I just want to conclude with my own choice, okay, that I have made. I came to the church history department not because I applied for the position, but because I was invited. And I left a very uh, enjoyable occupation that would have made me a considerable amount of money in order to do that. Working for the church? No. Oh, okay. I was working for a Chicago-based law firm in a solid office. And I left that early in my career by invitation of the church to come and learn church history. Why? Because church history was my passion. As an undergraduate, I studied under Jim Allen, who was the assistant church historian and chairman of the history department at BYU, did an honors thesis on church history. So it was my passion, but in those days, the wisdom was there are no jobs for historians. 
or as I can say today, there's no future in history. <laughs> so I went to law in order to make a living for my family, and I pursued history on the side. Then I had this invitation to come in and study the history of the church. During the 25 years that I had been there studying the history of the church, I had two things happen that I want to talk to you about. Number one is, I felt a need to make church history information more broadly accessible to the members of the church. And number two, because I had had broad access to that material myself, I have a desire to tell you how it's impacted me. I could at any time quit my current position, make more money, and go off on my own. Okay? I'm not being held into my church position because it's my livelihood. Okay, I have another profession, I have another livelihood I can go to and increase my income beyond what I get paid by the church to be a church employee. So why do I why do I stay where I stay? Because if you look at the total picture If you look at the total picture of the history of the church, like a million piece jigsaw puzzle, there may be little things here, and here, and here, and here, that sometimes catch people's attention that they want to focus on. What I do is I look at the totality of church history. Not just a few pieces of the puzzle, but the whole puzzle. And when I look at the whole puzzle, I see the hand of God bringing forth the restored gospel to the earth, and I see that hand of God operating in nations around the world. I stay because I really believe this. Okay? I really do. I believe that Joseph Smith was a prophet. I believe God appeared to him. I believe he translated the Book of Mormon by the gift and power of God. I believe that the priesthood was restored. I believe that the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is the Church of Jesus Christ on the earth today. And I want to leave you with that testimony in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. I want to thank all of you for coming tonight. And I want to thank you for the spirit that has been here, the cooperative, friendly, uh, kind spirit that you've also had. I wondered how this would play out. And we prayed that it would play out in a way that it would be helpful to everyone here. And I, I hope and pray still that it has been. Um, I want to thank for the church for a lifetime of study and thought and for being in a position to follow me as, as well as anyone in our church to answer these questions tonight. Has he been able to give an answer that has satisfied every one of you on every question? I doubt it. Could we, could anyone, could the collective intelligence of Mormonism do that? I don't know. I doubt it. I'm, I'm pretty sure I could not. Um, do I have lingering questions about some of this? Do I know, for instance, <coughs> gay people who are among the most wonderful people on earth? I do. And uh, can I understand why they have put born with these feelings or why they have these feelings? I don't know that they're born with them. They may be, they may not be. But they have them. And many of them, probably like their sisters, have tried to overcome them and haven't been able to. And now they're living a life that they think is honest and reflects their true identity. Yeah. But that's simple. Well, it's <laughs> sort of simple. Can I understand polyandry? No. Not really. Is that holy? I don't know. I can't say that Joseph Smith did anything that was unholy. That I can honestly say. That everything I know about him and his goodness and his compassion helps me at least suspend my judgment about what I don't know. 
And polyandry is one of those things. I, I personally couldn't live polygamy. And it's something my wife didn't live. I'm so grateful we came at a time when that wasn't the commandment of God for us. But again, if I look at the totality of the church, we haven't spoken tonight of the eternal progression of the glory of God being intelligence. We haven't talked of eternal families in the more normal sense of one husband, one wife, and children. <coughs> and when I, I look at those of you, Hans, you included, whom I know best here tonight, who are struggling with these things, I, my heart goes out to you. I, I feel love for you. I feel compassion. I wish deep down we might have helped you more than we have tonight. Uh, but I, I want to say to you, as the Savior said to his disciples after he fed the 5,000, and if you remember, they were very happy to have the bread and the water, but then Christ did what he always does with us, and that is he tried to take them to a higher level. And most of them left, remember, they walked away when he began to talk about himself as being the bread of life and the living water. And remember his exchange? He turned to his disciples and said, will you leave me also? And what did Peter answer? That's right. To whom should we go, Lord, for thou hast the words of eternal life? And that's what I want to say in my final testimony tonight. Where will you go? Those of you who have doubts, sure, we have some unexplicable things, inexplicable things that are difficult to answer. Some of them, if Rick had a day to spend with you on each of these questions, you'd see greater insight, you'd get maybe greater comfort. But maybe you would, maybe it would bother you all the more. And I know in my own case, I've just looked at the totality in my life. I've savored the fruits of the church. I've lived the commandments, and I can say in honesty and in sincerity, I know this is God's way of life. I know this is the way he wants his children to live, that the plan of salvation is his plan, and that our privilege in this life is to make that plan our plan, and to live our lives accordingly. And when we do that, though there are trials and tribulations and unanswered questions, uh, it is the best way of life. It is the happiest, most fulfilling, most growth-producing way of life. President Irene's dad, who was probably the finest uh, scientist the church has ever produced, said once that in science there are contradictions and there are unexplained questions and paradoxes. But he said, those things have never caused me to apostatize from my science. And in like manner, he said, there may be things about the church that I don't completely understand. He had what he called shelf issues, issues that he was put on a shelf, that he would suspend judgment on. And sometimes that's the way we have to handle a very few little things about this church. But the vast majority of what I've experienced and what I know speaks to my soul and to my heart and leads me to believe, brothers and sisters, this is God's way for our life. And I express that testimony and my love and appreciation and very best wishes to all of you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm very thankful that I could be here this evening. I am not a scientist, I'm not a scholar, I'm a very simple man, raised in very simple circumstances uh, in the aftermath for of the Second World War in Germany. I have not the privilege of a great educational background, but I have a solid testimony of the gospel of Jesus. Now, if you're saying, saying that, that doesn't mean that I didn't have the same questions. I was raised all my life with these type of questions lack of the priesthood, rural marriage, and all some of the things that we have discussed here. They came to me as they came to you. And since I did not 
did not know English at that time. I learned it later in my life. So I didn't have any, any way to go to the resources that we have right now. And, and the answer to the deal, one that was not translated into German at that time. I only had one way, one way to go and get answers for myself. And that was searching the scriptures. I'll just give you one example. talking about plural marriage and the difficulties that women have with this plural marriage. And I could understand everybody that would get in that, in that position. Because if I would be a woman and I tried to understand it, what they would do not understand. But then I read that it was hard for Sarah. It was hard for Rebecca. I just come to the scripture. It wasn't hard for them. It was the Joseph Smith time. Now who am I when I find the exact same problems of families? It was even causing the splitting of the family of Abraham was a quarrel between two wives that couldn't get along with one another. Split, the whole, split all of the, the sons and daughters of Abraham. So is it then astonishing to me that there were some when it was restored, this principle was restored for whatever reason, <coughs> that it was difficult for some at this time, but it was a time. So I think it was to appreciate and just like it. I'll practice it. And I see how the Lord has dealt in the scripture with his priesthood. Oh, the priesthood was always the same. I can see that the power was always the same. Yet the Lord determined. And he changed the way he would allow his people to have the priesthood. Oh, and out of time it was all patriarchal. Then it was reduced to a tribe. So there were different ways how the Lord has handled the priesthood. Now, it's expanded to all worthy men. Marvelous. But it's still the same priesthood. <coughs> now, I would like to share two things at the end. That has to do with this choice. I don't know one day he was faced with someone that has lost his faith. His name was Corio. And he did not know how to handle certain things. And Corio, as I understand the scriptures, believed in God. And I think that the reaction of Hama is a very He did this fight. He just asked him something. He said, He was accused that he would receive money for his labors. And now, if, you, if we do not receive anything for our labors in the church, Rama said, what does it profit us to labor in the church, save it where to declare the truth, that we may have rejoicing in the joy of our Lord? And then why sayest thou that we preach unto this people to get gain? When thou of thyself knowest that we receive only, and now believest thou that we deceive this people and cause us such joy in their hearts, and we say, Yes. You see, this is the choice. This is the choice that Corey will make in that moment. Because we can think and, and, and do what we want. The people that Alma taught were rejoicing in his teaching. They had peace in their heart. It made them better people, and they were more happy. And then when Alma put the question out to him, now believe it now that we are receiving them, and that that's what they have been doing, and he said, yes, I believe you deceive them. And then Alma said, now, Will he deny again that there is a God, and he also denied the Christ? For the old Christians, he can know there is a God, and also the Christ shall come. And now, what evidence have you that there is no God, or that Christ comes? I say unto you that he have none, save be the word of you. But behold, I have often the testimony that these things are true. And he also has faith in the Christ. And he said, Show me the sign. Show me the sign. Prove. And I will believe you. But I'm not going to.
Lord and thou hast that sign to know. Will you tempt your host? Will you say, show me the sign? And when you have testimony of all these things, and also the holy prophets, the scriptures are left for you. Yea, all things you know that there is above. Yea, all things even the earth and all things are upon the face of it. We have information of all the planets which meet in the regular form to witness that there is a supreme truth. If I come back to this picture, that is my contract. Christ warned before one prophet that he said, Be aware of false prophets. And he said, We shall know them. I have decided to investigate the truths of Joseph's medicine. And that's why I'm not going to go anywhere. For the truths that I see make men and women happy. And they make them better lives. <coughs> and they give me a perspective. They give me a whole power. They give me all the things that I need to have in my life. For me and for my family. Now I may not have the answers for all of us, but I surely know that when I follow this course, that I am a happy man. And so is my life. At the end, it's a choice. But when I do all of the things and everything, and I have read the book about the mountain metal method. I'm really interested. I have read the book Mormon Policy and Media History. I have read the book Mormonism in Transition. I have had my discussion with Professor Alexander, you know, in my trauma method, you know. You know, I, I was very, very, very interested. So I'm not naive of that statement. But I testify to you that looking at everything, not having all the answers, and also not being harsh. I think the church has taken a change in being harsh to people. Just think about the last comment that President Rudolph gave of gave homosexuality. We don't understand all the things. God loves his children. And there is a lot of things about injustice in Christ. And that is not only homosexuality. Why is someone born with him and others not? Why do some have to die at an age two? Or one week? Why has someone to die of cancer with 20 or with 19? Why does my father not can, 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 can get married even though she wants it more than anything else? Because she decided to live according to the commandments and to save the covenant. What should I count for? If I just want to take the 80 years, there is not an answer that I can give to any question. I can never say why this just. It is not just. But if I see a Joseph Smith of what he preached, where we are from, while we're here, and where we didn't go. I have a different perspective. And there will be answers. There will be answers. I testify to you that I know that Joseph Smith was a prophet. I know it because of the Book of Mormon. Whenever I have a question that I cannot answer, I go into the book, and it really doesn't matter where I go. And it takes <coughs> seconds that the Spirit comes. This book is true. And then I make a decision based on my feelings. Can I be wrong? Yeah. But there are other people. And there are every year 300,000 other people. So I am limited. And I want to mention it. And I testify this to you and invite you to really make your choice. Don't live where you live right now. Because right now, you live not there and not there. You are caught in the middle, which is terrible. Which is terrible. Honestly, I think you have to either go there just to find peace. And if you're not sure, 
stay calm for a moment. Stay just calm. And say, I may not have all the answers now. One day I will long go and preach it out to your neighbors and try to destroy the joy of your neighbors. Things are not getting better if I doubt it. A thousand people doubt with me. So you really, I invite you really to go for yourself, for yourself, maybe yourself.